Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another Travel Mall broadcast. And I am delighted today to have Jordi Mott, who is the owner. He is the man on Picture Perfect Tours. He's based in Halifax, Nova Scotia in Canada. Uh, so good morning to you, uh, Jordi. Good morning, Graham. Thank you so much for having me. No worries. Jordi, uh, you set yourself up a little bit with the name of the company, haven't you? Picture Perfect. What happens if the picture is not perfect? Well, then it's my fault. Uh, I have two seemingly useless degrees, one in photography and one in art history. And so Picture Perfect Tours allows me to combine that education background with tourism. And I can either take great pictures for people, hopefully, or I can teach them some of what I've learned over the years to help them create some really beautiful pictures. So if somebody, if somebody doesn't get good pictures, it's my fault, not their fault. <laughs> that's very good i like that you're taking responsibility that's good so um i understand a lot of your um photography tours uh take part on sable island and and nearby to halifax and in around around and about nova scotia i'm familiar with halifax like a lot of people would be i'm not quite so familiar with sable island is that just off the coast of halifax or does one have to go on a five-hour voyage to get there uh not five hours we go by helicopter and it takes about an hour and 15 minutes to get to sable island and a lot of people in our region in nova scotia eastern canada know about sable island and the history but a lot of people outside of our region don't and sable island is about just under 300 kilometers out in the middle of the north atlantic from halifax and if you put it another way we're about one, Sable Island is about one eighth of the journey on your way to the Azores out in Portugal. So the middle of nowhere, so far remote out in the open ocean. And just in this past decade, actually it was 2013, Parks Canada took over control of Sable Island from um, the Coast Guard. And it took a little while for Parks Canada to establish its rhythm and eventually allow tourism. And so in 2017, they started welcoming visitors, and we were one of the first companies to bring people out to Sable Island. And the reason uh, we go out is because it is a magical ribbon of sand, as we mentioned, so far remote out in the open ocean. And it's about 42 kilometers long, and maybe a kilometer and a half at its widest point. And it's all sand and dunes bound together with marram grass. And the big, big feature about Sable Island is the population of about 460 wild horses that have um, come to be naturalized on the island since arriving there in the 1760s. It's an interesting thing. Um, I mean, were they were these horses just uh, dumped on there by somebody that didn't want them anymore, or was the island uh, occupied at one point? What's the story there? The uh -huh. the written accounts. There's lots of rumors and, and yeah. legends of how they first got there with shipwrecks or so forth and such. But the documented rationale for the horses being there was that if you go back into Nova Scotia and Canadian history and in the 1760s, about 1755, uh, the British and the colony of Nova Scotia expelled the French farmers and settlers that were here. And they took a lot of the livestock with them. And a gentleman in Boston somehow had the right to set up a farm on this remote island off the coastline. And he had acquired a whole bunch of pigs, cows, chickens, horses that were of uh, French or Acadian heritage. And he sent some farmhands and all these livestock out to the island to start a farm. That failed miserably and all the animals perished except for the horses. And through genetic testing, it has been shown that these horses are in fact related to the Acadian stock of horses that were taken from the mainland back in the 1760s. That's very interesting. What's the vegetation there? Well, I mean, what do they survive on? I've seen horses on sand, sand islands before, and they develop these huge stomachs because they take in sand as well as vegetation. Is that the case on, on the Sable Island as well? Absolutely. And the main portion of their diet would be the marram grass which kind of dominates the dunes throughout the island but there's seasonal vegetation that they can uh, feast on throughout um, so in the and this past time of year sort of late summer early fall 
Uh, beach pea is a big uh, part of their diet. So they'll go through and they'll eat some of the berries that exist out there, some of the strawberries, uh, wild blueberries that grow out there, and just a whole wide range of vegetation they can feast on. However, in the winter, when things get a little more sparse, it's the marum grass that they kind of can dig through and, and eat, eat that primarily. And you're right, it's, it's a diet filled with uh, much more sand than you would ever expect, and it leads to a, an earlier mortality rate. Yeah. But you could argue very easily the quality of life the horses have is immense compared to um, mainland farm horses. And a uh, couple more questions on the horses themselves. Uh, do do the national parks get involved with the breeding? I mean, is there a sense of inbreeding that you could that that affects horses and that would affect the quality, if you like, uh, not only of life. Uh, of longevity, but also you know, all sorts of other things that might creep in. In the past, over the past few centuries, that has very much been a part of the dynamic of Sable Island and trying to expand the gene pool per se. But with Parks Canada taking over 10 years ago, they have uh, much like a net multinational policy, really. Yeah. They're hands off with all the wildlife on the island. And so they don't interfere. They don't help. They don't hurt they don't uh try to fix anything they let nature take its course and at this point with well for example there is 591 horses counted last year so there's quite the gene pool on the island and mm. their horses mm. spread out throughout that whole length of 42 kilometers they don't all roam together and they have different territories and so you do get an, enough genetic um, diversity across the island to keep the population healthy and uh, from what Parks Canada has been doing in that hands-off approach it's been proven successful because for example when they first took over just 10 years ago there was a population of about 350 so last year it peaked at about just under 600 there was a harsh winter and a, a larger die-off that was to be expected to be honest it's, it's rather cyclical in nature how the horse population works and it gotten to maybe an unsustainable level and this past winter, spring, a number of horses uh, passed away, but that's also made the, the population that is there now stronger in the long run. And, and I was going to say that was my final question the horses. It's actually not. Is there any, are they under threat at any point? Is it people going to come along and steal them, for example? No, no. I, it would be, these are absolutely wild creatures. I could not imagine someone trying to get close to them corral them onto a boat and bring them back to the mainland that used to happen in years past decades past um and it even came to the point where people were considering removing the horses in the 1950s 1960s because they thought it was just a, a cruel environment for them to live in and the horses were being rounded up put onto boats and shipped back to halifax here in the mainland but so many were getting uh, broken limbs, broken um, uh, legs from just the, the being forced onto the boats and the yeah. journey back. And in the 1960s, there is a letter writing campaign by school children taken up across Canada. And these children wrote to the then Prime Minister Diefenbaker asking him to stop the deportation of the horses for their own safety and welfare. And the Prime Minister agreed and intervened. And he then protected the horses, let them set them up as a, a naturalized species of the island to be left alone. And that's why we have the horses to this day. Excellent. That was my last question on the horses. <laughs> what I'd like to do now is, is just a little bit more detail on, um, I come along and I book presumably a day tour. We don't stay overnight on Sable Island. What From the beginning to end. So I meet you at some uh, heliport somewhere in Halifax. Take it from there. It's the journey to Sable Island, the adventure to Sable Island is an all day affair. And so you want to start early to make the most of your day. So I'll pick up people if you're staying in downtown Halifax. I pick you up early in the morning and we'll drive out to the airport and we meet our team out there. So the other guests is part of the adventure. And it's just the one day we're not allowed to stay overnight. Um, looked like we were moving in that direction, but COVID put an end to that discussion for the time being. 
So we're just doing a day adventure and we meet at the airport first thing in the morning. We go through a safety briefing on the helicopter with the flight crew. We have maybe seven guests total, plus myself usually as the guide. We also watch a safety video from Parks Canada talking about the do's and don'ts of the island when we're there. And from that point, if we've got good weather and the AOK from the air traffic control, we taxi out and fly off. And it's a beautiful low flight of what's called the Eastern shore of Nova Scotia. And we have just about 7,000 kilometers of coastline. And so we fly over a good portion of that as we get out to the open ocean over Sable. And from there, it's kind of a quieter period. We can talk to each other in the helicopter through uh, noise canceling headphones and speakers. And so we can kind of chat about the island, what to expect. People ask questions about history and, and the what, what they're going to encounter. And pretty soon, this is where you're starting to think this is getting to be a long journey. You can just see a little crescent of sand off the, the pilot's shoulders as you look ahead. And that's Sable. And you start to fly over and this, you can see the color change in the ocean as that deep water gets shallower and shallower. And all of a sudden it's tropical looking waters and this immense long white sand beach dotted with seals all across in the surf and on the beach. And you start to get over that marim grass of the island. And all of a sudden you'll start to spot one or two bands of horses as you're flying nice and low over the island. And we land at what's called Main Station, which was first built in about 1946 and by the um, uh, Environment Canada at that point. And that's where Parks Canada have their buildings for their staff, accommodation, kitchens, their garage for all their tools, vehicles, so forth and such. So we land there on the helipad. We cart our gear and lunch and clothes into the main station building called the main part of the main station, uh, affectionately known as the Sandbar Hotel. And we get a little room in there that's ours for the day with a washroom and kettle and microwave. We can leave our gear behind, kind of figure out what kind of layers of clothing we want to bring. We meet the Parks Canada staff who live on the island for that period of time. We again, go over the do's and don'ts of safety. And from that point on, it's about maybe 10 in the morning, we head out and we hike west. So we have the sun behind us for taking pictures. And we walk to we walk through the dunes to a series of freshwater ponds where the horses are usually gathering after breakfast. And so they're kind of like us. They've had a bite to eat and they want to have a drink of water after or something, something to hydrate with. And oh. so we can usually catch the horses in those ponds after their breakfast. And so that's the goal of the morning. And as we're walking through the dunes, we'll talk about how the staff on the island, how they get fresh water, how the horses, the seals, the birds that all live there, how they survive and what they're eating on. And we'll come across some of the thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of really interesting remnants of human settlement on the island that's been permanent since 1801. And as you're walking, you can find old wrenches, you can find bottles washed ashore, you can find parts of old stoves sticking out of dunes. And it's just a fascinating mix of wildlife, history, remote, untouched nature that um, is for everyone enthralling. And so at this point- and, one, so, oh, sorry. and when you're doing this, while you're walking along and you see horses at a freshwater pool, is this when you as a professional photographer give people a little instruction or are they, are they all gifted amateurs with lenses as long as my arm to try and get really good pictures? Most people show up with an iPhone, which is still a spectacular device. And there's lots Indeed. of great tips yeah. and tricks to make the most of an iPhone. So even before we leave, I give people a, a package of information about photos specifically about what kind of settings to use uh, with an iPhone or with your, your larger camera and kind of share with people some of the mistakes I've made in the past photographing on the island so they can avoid those mistakes themselves. And once we're out there, I'll kind of remind people, hey, is your make sure your shutter speed is fast enough. If you've zoomed out with your lens, that shutter speed has to be faster than the length of the zoom you've got on. Um, or if an iPhone 
people like to take videos of the moment and I'll maybe switch them over to slow-mo because you get a little bouncy and things are happening. It's really windy. Slow motion, you can really capture that, that incredible scene that's unfolding, but it just looks a bit more cinematic when it's slowed down and mm. it looks more mm. professional. So kind of help people before we go out. And then once we're on the island, I'll share with them some of those tips. And so, so what happens, is this pretty much the modus operandi for the rest of the day, walking around and studying and picking up? And so, and have a spot of lunch, you finish what time? It, five o'clock or something? Our departure time is set by Transport Canada. So the helicopter folks, they have to be back on the ground in Halifax just before sunset. So depending right. on the time of year depends on the, the departure time. And the visitor season in Sable Island is from June to the end of October. And so end of October, we've got a slightly shorter day than maybe what we would in June. Mm -hmm. And the day is spent, as you, as you mentioned, we're walking, I'll walk up to 12 kilometers in a day, which can be quite taxing in the soft sand in the summer yeah. heat. But everyone is just filled with adrenaline and excitement and watching these wild untamed creatures the horses just gallivant and play and run across the island and to come up to the seals on the beach there's hundreds of thousands of gray seals all dotted along the island and to come up to the groups of seals and if you you scatter the herd that are on the beach they'll jump into the surf and in the water and as you walk along the edge of the shoreline this herd of seals will follow you like a pack of puppy dogs and it's yeah. just it's fascinating and the different birds you find on the island uh, the ipswich sparrow is native to sable it only breeds and on um, sable and you'll see those throughout the summer and also a wide variety of other birds that have maybe been blown off course or just kind of taken a break on the island that you wouldn't expect to see to see there so from snowy owls to a variety of herons and plovers it's quite the it's quite the bird lovers paradise as well it sounds absolutely fantastic matt um, Jordi, I mean, uh, the final question really was about how do you protect that environment? I suppose with National Parks Canada there, they're going to be fairly strict on what you can do, but also the nature of someone that wants to go on a trip like this, they're probably already uh, crossed from the dark side in terms of environment and they're, they're committed people and they're not going to drop litter. They're not going to do stuff to disturb the local environment, be it, be it, be it mammals or be it fauna or insects, you know, they're all going to be protective. I'm assuming that's the case and you don't have to bring out your baseball bat and beat someone to a pulp every so often. No, I don't. I, I carry a tripod for that. I don't have to bring a baseball so I can threaten people with that. But uh, And you're absolutely right. Parks Canada, again, has these federal policies that are adhered to in all national parks. But with Sable Island in particular, it's probably even more so to pay attention to these regulations and follow them because it's it's not it's our safety first and foremost that they're there for but also the wildlife's safety as well and for the horses they're such untamed unpredictable animals that are huge with no predators and no fear of people it's up to us to maintain a 20 meter distance between all wildlife whether that's the horses or the seals the seals mm -hmm. they'll scatter and they'll maintain that 20 meters no problem for us. The horses, however, they don't quite understand that rule. And so my head is always on a swivel watching for bands of horses that might pop up behind us, always kind of watching how far our guests are, making sure that everyone's got that 20 meter buffer zone. And even watching say two males and having been making numerous trips out to Sable since 2017, we can kind of get a sense of when two males might start to fight over territory or fight over females and you want even more than 20 meters in that yeah. sense and so that's one massive regulation that we definitely adhere to to keep our guests safe and the wildlife safe we also keep five meters back from any fresh water ponds because we don't want anything on our, our clothing or our footwear to contaminate no. the drinking water that the horses or other animals might use we stay well back from the dunes these are so they can be towering sand dunes bound together with the grass. But if you step too close to an edge, it's very easy to topple over and break a leg, twist an ankle. And we're a long, we're a long way from help back in Halifax if we need to get you back 
on the helicopter yeah. and to the hospital yeah. in case of emergency. So we stay back from there. And even before we leave the airport and climb aboard the helicopter, we also disinfect our footwear. Again, just to make sure we're not passing any pathogens, bacteria oh. onto yeah. the islands, and we're not wearing any clothing that you'd maybe you would have worn to uh, a farm or a horse stable. So my daughter rides horses, and I have a separate set of clothes that I only wear when I go to to her riding visits that I don't ever bring to Sydney. It's a really interesting because I've been on some islands in New Zealand that are uninhabited. And because the animals are not used to humans, like it's particularly birds, they're not frightened. So they will almost come in your face. And at first it's a little bit disconcerting, but after a while you get used to it. And it's just, you know, Sable Islands, anything like that, including the horses, it must be an absolutely fantastic experience. And I thank you very much for detailing it. And I've just checked my diary and I am free June 2024. Let's do it. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you, Ruth. Really appreciate it. Cheers.